Should be soon now. Okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Jean Lapierre here. I just want to sort of point out the, uh, that uh, on the upper right hand, we have the button for Q&A. So if you click on that, you'll be able to uh, ask and pose questions, which we'll get to towards the end of the session. Great. Well, uh, today I'm, I'd love, I'm very happy to present to you uh, Christian Sauvé, who manages EA uh, at uh, Public Service Commission. His experience in web systems development, corporate IMIT governance, client portfolio management, science fiction writing, movie reviewing, possibly uh, I guess, uh, some reggae uh, uh, DJing on the side, Lego bricks uh, building, have all led him to enterprise architecture. He lives in Gatineau, Quebec. And uh, he'll be talking about evolving at EA and uh, digital transformation in a small agency today. Over you to Christian. Over you, Christian. Well, thank you very much, Jean. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. And this will be my, my third invitation to speak at this conference. Uh, if you've attended any of my previous conferences and you're back for more, why? Uh, but really, I'm trying to, um, I, I will be trying to not repeat myself. I, uh, if ever there's some material that is repeated, I will try to contextualize it in a wider context, uh, and this being the point of this presentation. Um, Essentially, uh, one thing, if you're, you're new to my presentations, one thing you'll realize that I'm big on talking about practical enterprise architecture in small organizations. Uh, I do think that the discipline of enterprise architecture in a small organization is different, that in many cases can have more influence on the course of what this uh, the organization can do. Uh, and the, the role that is played um, by enterprise architecture in smaller teams can be more crucial to the way the organization moves forward. So we're going to take a look at how crisis and transformation both require adaptability and creativity. We're going to take a look at how enterprise architecture groups can evolve uh, their approach to be valuable partners whenever everything is being questioned, such as in a time of pandemic. Uh, we're going to take a look at how EA and small organizations can take advantage of their influence on the organization to steer major projects, shape governance, and set the pace of digital transformation. Uh, this session will describe how the EA team at the PSC has been able to evolve over the last few years and contribute effectively to the organization's ability to respond to new challenges. Uh, I'll remind you that I will be speaking about the Public Service Commission, but not for the Public Service Commission. Uh, we are a relatively venerable organization as far as federal departments are concerned. We were founded in 1908 with the mandate of protecting merit in the federal public service. So taking aim at nepotism, favoritism, as were prevalent at the time. It took some time for that lesson to sink in. In uh, 1910, for instance, our first two commissioners were fired for accepting bribes. Uh, we've learned a lot since then, and this is not a bit of corporate history that is often mentioned. But anyway, uh, right now we are considered a small organization by federal standards. Small as in 800 employees, 100 of them in IT. Doesn't sound small to me, but that that's what TBS has said. And while this makes a few people at the PSC feel less important, it also spares us from a number of reporting requirements, at which point we gladly accept that we're a small organization. We currently have, whatever that means, one headquarter in Gatineau and four regional offices in Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. So uh, don't feel free to come and say hi. But anyway, uh, what do we do? Uh, the the general public knows us for the GC Jobs hiring staffing site. Uh, if you're a federal public servant, you probably know the PSC because we do second language assessment. In fact, my team is, whenever we're in the office, uh, we're sitting on the, the, the fearsome floor of the federal public service, which would be the third floor of 22 Eddy, where people go to have their second language assessments conducted. A time of high stress, we sympathize a lot. We 
often see our floor mentioned uh, in very shaky terms on forums and so on. Uh, but that's what uh, most federal public servants know us for. As far as other departments or heads of departments know us for, it's for staffing policies, investigations, and audits whenever we suspect that something is not upholding merit. Uh, just a note about enterprise architecture at the PSC. We had a first failed attempt in 2008-2011. I mention it because uh, it was a very traditional type of enterprise architecture, following all the frameworks, focusing on the, the higher level uh, strat stra strategic uh, quadrant, and it was composed of one manager slash architect. Uh, that practice died in 2011. It was killed by shared services in two ways. First, we were dead certain at the time that enterprise architecture would naturally migrate to SSC and never be uh, a concern of federal public, um, of federal departments. Uh, it also died because the email transformation initiative uh, went underway and it was correctly assessed that the manager architect was more useful as a project manager for ETI than an enterprise architect. So the EA practice died and I was there to witness it. And if you want to talk about a defining trauma for the new version of the enterprise architecture practice at the PSC, that would be it. How do we prevent another dismantling? How do we ensure that the enterprise architecture practice is sufficiently integrated and useful to the organization that we're not seen as a a set of people to reassign to other priorities when the other priorities become more urgent. Um, our current incarnation was created in 2016. This time we had the necessary resources to do the job in that we had one IT4 manager, that would be me, as well as three technical specialists at the IT3 level. Um, our responsibilities in this environment in a small organization are slightly different than enterprise architecture in bigger departments. Uh, we do client portfolio management. We talk to business partners all the time, for instance, and we help them uh, create their project proposal. We help them bring in new technology. So this, there, there's a fundamental client relationship aspect to what we do that is not necessarily reflected in what EA does in other departments. We also administer two IT governance committees. We administer the IT-focused architecture review committee, which is a meeting of all IMIT managers together. It takes place every week. It's roughly the equivalent of the ARB, uh, but it does a little bit more than that. We also administer the partner-focused business operation review group, which brings together IT operations specialists as well as business partners so that we can talk amongst ourselves about upcoming operational changes and a number of these, these things that are of interest to both parties. If I take a step back and take a look at the stages of the, our, the development of our EA practice uh, since uh, 2016, I can see four stages either completed, underway, or that we can anticipate. And I'm going to dig into these uh, as I advance in my presentation. Stage one, obviously, is understanding the environment we're in. Uh, it's about formal enterprise architecture practice. It's about drafting the foundational documents that you need in order to be explained in order to explain the architecture of the organization. Uh, that took a little bit longer than expected in our case because yes, the first year we did EA, we were focused on project managing the email transformation initiative again, which didn't go away during the time we weren't doing enterprise architecture. But anyway, that's long gone. Uh, stage two, once we had mastered the environment, the architecture in where we were operating was about adapting to the enterprise. It was about focusing on intake, as we'll detail in the next few slides. It was about uh, not just processing intake as in taking care of intake, but also putting a process around intake so that you can predictably say this is what's going to happen if we want to introduce a new technology. We had a number of unexpected consequences that we'll study in the next few slides. And at the end of this stage, we were stress tested by the pandemic in ways I will also describe later. Uh, right now, we're taking 
taking a look at what I think is the next stage of our evolution, which is focusing on a partner portfolio approach, being able to be involved very early uh, in a project proposal, also being able to involve our business partners in the drafting of our IMIT architecture and roadmaps and blueprints. Uh, as far as stage four, I'm thinking we're probably headed towards enterprise digital planning, but I hope to be able to talk to you about these things at, a, an, at an upcoming digital transformation in government conference. So back to stage one, a number of lessons we learned. Uh, stage one was about reading the rule book, really. We didn't know what we were doing, so we relied on frameworks, we relied on TOGAF, we relied on Gartner advice, we relied on uh, how can we analyze the reality of our organization, how can we draft our essential documents, the, the standards which we use the technology brick paradigm for, given that it gives us an opportunity to track standards as they evolve in time. There's that work again evolve. Uh, blueprints, roadmaps, it's also a time where we gathered allies in that a number of early decisions can help a lot in position EA as someone you should feel free to talk to, uh, people, uh, some a, a team that is involved in ongoing activities and projects. Uh, we start by taking over a number of, of EA adjacent functions, the APM review cycle, the documentation of standards, the administration of technical level governance committees, committees. Um, <clears throat> a lot of these things were things that people didn't really want to do. So we were there, it fit within our plans, and we used that as springboards for other activities. Uh, we also became a predictable enterprise architecture function. We documented everything. We made our documentation public. We always talked and, and, and asked the same questions so that people would know what to expect when they dealt with enterprise architecture. Uh, and we also developed relationships also with IT colleagues, but also with business colleagues. Uh, we did the work that no one else wanted. We provided added value to other projects. We became a sponge for information that we then shared with everyone. Uh, <clears throat> this slide, and, and please don't take notes while I'm doing my presentation. For one thing, uh, it's not that interesting. The other thing is that uh, all of this presentation and I think the recording of this presentation will be available later. So if you're curious about some of the graphics, the charts I'm showing, uh, just uh, wait until the PDF becomes available or write to me and I'll send you not just this presentation but the supporting documentation as well. Uh, so what you're seeing on this screen, I won't talk about it too much because I've talked about these things in previous presentations, is a, a sample of our architecture blueprint and roadmap, which is heavily inspired by the Canadian business capabilities model, but also introduces a number of things uh, that are uh, of interest to the PSC. Uh, and we also have one sample technology brick that shows you how standards evolve from emerging to approve to contain to, to be retired. Uh, so two, two things that are really Really helpful, but that you have to keep up. Uh, that you have to keep updated, even if there's there are more interesting things to do. And yes, I'm sharing my to-do list with you right now. Uh, anyway. <clears throat> The, the way you move from stage one to stage two is by adapting. Uh, a number of things we realized during our journey is that we have to remain practical. Uh, it, it, we don't have the resources to spend time on meta models or EA repositories. So we, we remain practical, we remain focused on the requirements of our our, our colleagues and our partners. Uh, if it's not useful to your organization, your colleague, does it need to be done? In a similar vein, we do not use an EA repository. There is no business justification for an organization our size to use it. There are no return on investment in implementing it. In fact, it's a negative return on investment because then if you've created a repository, you have to feed it until forever. Uh, so it, we cannot justify such a thing in our environment. And for that reason, we're not using it. We are working in the open. We are working using Word, PowerPoint, Excel, because when we generate something, we can then share it with our colleagues. These things are immediately useful to other people. And that's why we try to, as I say, build in the open. Um, we've adapted our approach to hiring in that we're trying not to hire enterprise architects, but people who are ready to become enterprise architects. I'll have more to, the, to say about that in a slide or two, uh, but we're looking for IT experience, analytical skills, communication abilities. And these are all things we can test through our hiring process. 
Uh, it does take time to train someone to be an architect, but let's face it, any new enterprise architect is going to take months anyway in order to learn your organization and be able to contribute back. Uh, and finally, we realized we had to be active participants in governance. We had to understand what governance was and what governance could do for us. Uh, so we, we position enterprise architecture review as a regular habit rather than this exceptional event planned according to quarterly meetings uh, in, in ways that are done elsewhere. We also shifted to an analytical capability or capacity. Uh, I'm going to ruffle a few feathers here, but I think architect is really another word for analyst. I know, I know, some of you don't like hearing that. And, and frankly, is there a better racket out there than enterprise architecture? It allows me to be a professional technology grump forever. What a racket, I love it. But frankly, if you take a step back and you look inside your heart, uh, you'll realize that analysts and architect are very similar things. It's, a, it's the ability to gather data, synthesize information, recommend a course of action, and communicate this conclusion to others. Uh, skill sets will always be job descriptions when you're in, in the heat of things. I mean, can your architects manage projects? Because ours can, ours have. We had a major success last year in replacing an, out, an, out, an outdated scheduling system with a newer one, and it was because the enterprise architect assigned to the file was not only able to do business analysis, was also able to do change management, and was able to do project management as well. It was a one-stop shop. It's not something we intend on repeating on a regular basis, but it's really useful to have these skill sets in your inventory to deploy whenever you need it. And that will feed later on in my case study and the way we reacted to the pandemic. Um, so essentially, don't go hiring pre-made architects. Those are rare uh, anyway, and they're busy. They're all being absorbed by other departments. Uh, when there's a much wider pool of analysts that are ready to become uh, enterprise architects. So have a hiring process that reflects reality. In our case, we send off scenarios. We ask people to think, to analyze these scenarios, to recommend the options, to present them, and to reflect on the analytical process they've just undergone. And this is something I can share with you if ever you're in the, the mood to hire enterprise architects. Uh, essentially, I would recommend that you position EA as the X-Files, the, the place where all the unclear, weird requests that no one really knows what to do with, they should be sent to EA. And EA should be ready to <clears throat> work on them and issue recommendations that are clear and actionable so that there's no more ambiguity left in it. Uh, shifting to intake is one of the major aspects of our second stage. Uh, if I'm to be quoted for anything in this presentation, it's this. I believe that the single most efficient use of EA dollars in a small organization is at the intake level. Because once you've understood your architecture, the best way to keep a hold on it is to be able to analyze what comes in. So try to become a rallying point for the analysis that is required before any new piece of technology is introduced. Go around, integrate your domain-specific questions in an intake template. Go speak to the IT security manager and ask them what bothers them whenever new technologies are introduced. Do the same thing with information management, with QA, with uh, application development, with operations, servers, desktops, whatever. Go around the table, ask them what are the questions they want to ask whenever a new new piece of technology is introduced and integrate all of this. You, Your team should be able to coordinate, do first pass analysis for architectural compliance, be able to identify any potential red flags and go consult domain experts on those. And this is all described on slide 22. Uh, so formalize a process until everyone can anticipate your next question. EA can be involved in the decision-making process through the intake. We'll, we'll look at that uh, in a few slides, but understand the prioritization process will 
will lead you to ask better questions that will inform this prioritization process. It's always useful to know what's coming out downstream so you can send the proper inputs to that process. Uh, and also EA in becoming the face of intake can also come to represent the business partner's perspective at the IT management table, which is not always obvious and not always an assigned role to anyone. Um, and again, this is all in service of remaining practical, business-centric as a key to relevance in times of crisis. So how can EA provide value in operations focus early pandemic? I'm going to leave you with that question. We'll come back to it in a few slides. There are, however, a few unexpected consequences to positioning yourself as intake management. Uh, you will be able to, you will be asked by management always to clarify the intake funnel to EA, to provide a prioritization framework, because what do we do with these requests that are piling up? You will be asked to present new intake regularly to IT management, which is a huge opportunity for enterprise architecture. You'll be able or asked to develop a post-approval implementation process. You'll be asked to take care of the outtake as well. And this is a summary of the next few slides. Uh, all of this reinforces the role of EA as, um, uh, as an essential part of IT operations, not just project, not just strategy, but IT operations. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, and, and I have uh, one of those, uh, uh, one of our valued business partners is attending this uh, conference. And a question we often get from business partners working with us on intake is, where's my technology so be ready to face that question a lot if you if you present yourself as the face of intake I'm briefly going to talk about intake funneling. These are interesting things to map out and understand and present to others whenever they're asking you, where does your intake come from? Uh, this is a, a cartoonish summary of what we've learned so far, but essentially intake can come from IT direction, can come from IT management, can come from the help desk, can come from clients, but can also be influenced by things beyond those direct channels. So it's always useful to be able to map these things out and say, this is probably how it happens and oh by the way if if business management has hallway conversations with our management here's what's likely to happen next and also define that EA when given intake can take a number of of steps in or and you can close the intake if it's nonsensical or if it duplicates another request you can do options analysis which feeds back into intake can do new technology intake can do new project proposals can do propose uh, recommendations to change IT policies, for instance. This has happened quite a bit in our case. So it's not just about new technology. It's also what is required for us to move forward on this. And sometimes it requires new IT policies or adjustments to existing policies. So that's all part of the intake funnel. After that, uh, you also get a look at how things get done. And we were asked in enterprise architecture, since we understood how the process worked, uh, to help define what happened after that. So the client talks to us with a jumble of ideas. We, we shape all of this into a new work package. That new work package goes to IT management for uh, approval and then for scheduling and consultation with PMO and the managers responsible for the level of effort of all of these things. So uh, I'm simplifying a lot and I would enjoy talking to this, uh, uh, talking to you about this for you know at least another 40 minutes, but we don't have time right now. Uh, I do want to touch, however, upon the prioritization frame framework that we were asked to develop, uh, all of which is detailed on slides 23 and 24. Um, in that it wasn't enough to present new technology and take. They also had to present to IT management an idea of how important these these new packages were and how urgent these new packages were so that informed decisions could take place regarding which one should we work on first given limited resources uh, so all of this is combined in a bubble chart that is that can be used to set priorities uh, going forward for the organization uh, and it is part this is not something we anticipated in enterprise architecture but it's something that became necessary because we understood this flow of of intake better than anyone else. 
The flip side of intake is, of course, outtake. So in order to understand and document your architecture, you have to take into account what gets taken out as much as what gets taken in. Otherwise, years later, you're going to find yourself on a goose chase where everybody's looking for you know, who owns a database that hasn't been used in 10 years. True story. Uh, in any case, decommissioning technology is rarely as simple as deleting files. Uh, you have, if you remove a server application, is there anything left on that server? Can the server be removed? Is there information to keep in case of legal obligations, ATIP requests, legislative holds, and so on? Uh, are there any cost savings from not renewing licenses? Even the act of paying attention to whether licenses are being used or not can, can result in significant cost savings for any organization. So as much as we ask the viewpoint of everyone around the IT management table for new technology intake, they also have questions whenever we take out technologies. So we applied our new technology intake method to the old technology outtake, perfectly valid English, uh, which, uh, which meant a formal documentation to identify red flags based on domain specific concerns, which meant a similar process to gather information, seek consensus and get approval, as well as build a solid base of information awareness for the people who will actually decommission the these technologies. So all of this stage two work was stress tested during the pandemic. If you were around at the time, you recall how uh, all organizations tumbled down uh, the uh, Maslow's pyramid of IT requirements in that we were no longer talking about strategy or long-term projects. It was all about operations, making sure we had the tools required to do the very basics of our jobs. So at that point, uh, this, this you know, idea of working at the enterprise level became very urgent and very specific to operational requirements. Uh, and this is my favorite part of this presentation where I get to tell you that Gartner is wrong. Uh, I really enjoy that. Anyway, uh, Gartner, in telling you how to set up an EA practice, will tell you, please focus on the strategic enterprise quadrant as opposed to the project operational one. Don't believe them. This advice will get you killed. Uh, you need to remain relevant to everyone and you need to demonstrate added value to the broadest number of people and partners. You also need to shift according to the current priorities. A hyper focus on enterprise strategy will prevent you from doing that. Uh, in our case, EA was able to remain relevant through the worst of the crisis by focusing on operational activity support, but because we were hiring analysts, we also had the skill set to do things such as client portfolio specialists, business analysts, change managers, and communication consultants. We were also able to provide and adapt a governance framework. Remember, we were the one administering two IT governance committees while everyone else was figuring out what to do and how to react. We kept having these weekly, these bi-weekly check-ins, and for for a while, they were the only air, the only regular meetings that IT managers could discuss amongst themselves what they were all doing in their own areas. Uh, this also led to the case study, which was the how EA helped introducing the M365 platform in the organization. Uh, we had been planning on doing it since at least 2018, but obviously the pandemic sped things up quite a bit. Uh, we were there uh, when GC collaboration from April to September 2020 was introduced as a pilot project. We were also there when we went from GC collaboration to M365 overnight. And, and start using M365 as a foundational enterprise technology. The approach that the PSC chose for itself in introducing M365 or Office uh, 365 was very gradual. We would focus on those modules that were of most interest to us. And then over time, we would gradually integrate more and more things, knowing how to do it and not uh, taking hasty decisions that would, say, result in thousands of SharePoint sites being uncontrolled uh, and, and widely available. So uh, we've taken another approach and EA was, was there to help this 
process out. In June 2020, for instance, we were able to consult with this business partners to draft requirements. We had something like 24 meetings in two weeks in order to consult all business areas of the PSC as to what they expected from this new platform. It was quite an exercise, but it really worked because at the end, we had a complete overview of what the organization was expecting from the platform. Uh, in April, from April to October 2020, we were there to do the change management and the communication work for the introduction of GC collaboration, as well as the shift to M365. Uh, in October 2020, going on until the present, we were able to adapt our new technology intake for the inclusion of new M365 modules. In summer 2021, we were able to bring together about eight different streams of ideas on how to develop M365 as a, as a platform and integrate all of that into a roadmap for M365 module, pathfinding, and implementation. Uh, and in late 2021, we were able to recommend and help the the um, the adoption of Justice's Office Entry M365 tool to fulfill our own business requirements. The first time I can remember that we were able to take something developed in another department almost as is and implement it on our tenant. As we end stage two, uh, we are moving towards stage three, that's portfolio management. We want to be part of the business early planning process. We want to be there whenever we um, are able to build enterprise level proposal based on scattered smaller requirements that are present throughout the organization. We also want to offer a seamless service from idea to execution. And the ways in which we're planning on doing that are to be involved in gate zero, you know, be there at the very start of whenever a project gets, la gets launched so that we can help shape the scope, shape the architecture, shape the, the nature of the work to be completed. We also want to solicit business input in architectural roadmaps. Uh, so essentially be able to merge as much as possible business and IT plans into one coherent architecture. And we also want to integrate business analysis, which I think is fundamental to be able to understand the business requirements but also some develop something that makes everybody happy, essentially. In the meantime, we're, in, we're involved in enterprise projects such as the e-testing room renewal, my focus this week. Talk to me next week and I may not be as optimistic, but right now is the honeymoon phase where we've got a nice little proposal that everyone agrees on. But of course, now it's up to submission to management. I expect to be less optimistic next week, but again, you know, contact me to find out. Uh, but we're also taking a look at enterprise reporting solutions, client relationship management solutions, ticketing systems. You're seeing a, a pattern there, which is approaching fundamental business problems from the enterprise level. This is something I hope to be able to, to develop over the next few years years. So what have we learned along the way as we near our conclusion? Uh, don't be limited by the traditional definition of EA. Frameworks, tools, they're useful, they're nice, they're helpful, but they're there to help. They're not there to enslave you. Don't create a monster that you'll be stuck feeding until the end uh, of, of the universe or whatever comes first. Uh, go where your needs lead you. Listen to the organization as the organization will hint at what it expects from its EA practice. Focus on what is practical, useful, and understood by the largest number of, of people possible. Um, do iterate, adapt, reevaluate, plan for change, change your plans. If you take a look at my first two presentations I did in previous instances of this conference, you will see that things have changed, and that's normal. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just that the situation change and you should change in turn. And finally, per perhaps the most important thing, make friends. Um, EA is useless on its own. It's unstoppable in collaboration. You really have to be the bridge builder, the consensus builders, the people who bring everyone together from your unique, your unique vantage point as enterprise architects. And being able to build relationships to make friends is fundamental to that. So on this somewhat happy and humane note, uh, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm ready for your questions and your comments. And always keep calm. And and architect the enterprise. <laughs> Words to live by. Uh, thanks very much, Christian. Uh, we don't have any questions yet, so just a reminder to everyone here. There's a, there's a bunch on the line still. I can see. Um, 
please feel free to, to post your questions if you have any. Um, in the meantime, maybe I can I can sort of try to pose a question. Um, I went and checked, not trying to in trying to stump the chump or anything, but just looking at uh, the uh, some of the one of the last presentations of public service commissions at the GCERB was for the GC jobs transformation uh, last year, but a little over a year ago, right? I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if there are any, if we can, uh, if, if there's uh, any such big, uh, big items that we, uh, we can expect to be coming from PSC in the, in the near future. Or well, it's interesting future. that you bring this presentation up because that is one example of adapting to change in that we were headed in one direction. And unfortunately, our, our, our testing of this solution ended up producing results that were not entirely acceptable by management. So uh, we took another look at what we were doing and we, we took another look at the business requirements and we were able to shift the project in a slightly different direction in order to accommodate the changing requirements the limitations of one solution and the opportunities offered by another solution. And, and I think that as much as you know, nobody really likes to admit that, oh, well, we went into the, 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 the suboptimal direction. I think that this part of, of questioning, of being able to rethink, take a step back and say, wait a minute, what are we doing? Is this still the optimal path? Is still the thing that will make our business partners happy? Is this the thing that will uh, that will answer our business problems and being able to have, well, I think the discipline and the courage to say this may not necessarily be the best way to go uh, is integral to to government work in uh, in general. And I think that we were able to do that, quite proud of doing that. So yes, expect a presentation to GCERB, which will uh, reflect the changes that happened to that project ever since that. Okay, great. Uh, still have no questions. Um, I think we can talk a little bit about how, I mean, you're presenting uh, for for uh, the experience and the journey for, for a small organization. However, I think it doesn't really, it, it's clear that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what you're talking about should apply, uh, no matter what the size of the, the department, uh, in terms of being relevant, staying relevant, making sure that um, you can't be squashed. We we have exper experienced uh, uh, entire enterprise architecture teams being, I guess, uh, decimated uh, previously um, because it wasn't viewed as something that was uh, urgent or needed uh, uh, by the department when it came time to uh, look for cuts and so on. So I don't know if you, uh, if you want to speak to that or just to re reemphasize what you've been speaking about. I think the fundamentals remain uh, the same when no matter where you're whether you're a big or a small department, whether you have four or forty people to work with. However, I think the the tactics can change, and there can also be a difference in terms of speed of 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 response in that one of the advantages, one of the best things about working in a small organization is that you still have this this relationship with many people, and you can use that can also use the size of the organization as a way to react very quickly to some uh, some situations. Uh, recently, I was involved in an analytical file in which I was able to go interview a lot of people in a very short amount of time and being able to present a recommendation six days after being tasked with, uh, with the file, which probably would not have been possible in a bigger organization. But you, you learn, you have organizations, bigger organizations on the other hand, have a lot of advantages that smaller organizations don't. You have a lot more firepower. You probably have a more diverse number of skills in your team. And you have to understand the various advantages and disadvantages. You also have to understand the strengths you've got, the tools you've got in your toolbox to be able to use it. So really, uh, I would enjoy hearing a presentation on how the enterprise architecture practice has shifted or evolved in a bigger organization. I think the details may be different, but the overall intentions behind and the overall results that you get may be the same. Okay, but that's all good points. I would say that sometimes it tends, tends to be towards, uh, uh, say, a, an oil tanker, and that the larger you get, the longer, the, the more time it takes for you to to shift and pivot uh, 
or it would just start, start and, uh, and slow down. Uh, that's, that, that's right, but sailboats can't carry tons and tons of oil. So you, you, you've got, <laughs> you know, you have to use the right tool for the right job. <laughs> There's that too. Uh, well, we're getting lots of questions now. Uh, so uh, one question is, I hope I did not miss it, but have you talked about what training you offer to the potential EA hires that you recruit? Uh, that's a question that comes up. I'm always pleased to say that we offer TOGAF training, but we don't offer it until six to nine months after the, the enterprise architect, architect has joined our organization. Uh, we found through through uh, practical experience that uh, while training, formal training is really important, provides you with a lot of contextual information, you also have to have some basics in place so that the TOGAF training allows you to connect the dots. Uh, it, it was quite an experience to send off our, our enterprise architects as, after a few months to TOGAF and they come back and they go, oh, now I see how it fits together, how this this piece and that other piece all go together and it just strengthens the TOGAF training for them to be able to link the, the training to things they've seen in the field or things they've already seen in practice. The other advantage for uh, an enterprise architect manager in sending off um, enterprise architects to formal training uh, months after they've joined the organization is that they go there, they learn a lot of stuff, then they come back and they tell you everything we've been doing wrong. Absolutely, I've, I've read an article to that effect saying that you should not send anyone on TOGAF early because they will just be frustrated when they get back to, to understand that uh, perhaps the maturity of, of your organization isn't, uh, isn't as fulsome as what TOGAF could support. Um, we have some more questions. Um, what will be your view? What, what's your view about the flexibility of EA, for example, for a small agency during the working day? It supports a thousand users, but during the weekend or nights, it probably only supports 10 users. How would EA be flexible for those changes? Every organization sets its rules. However, we I tend to see EA as quite flexible to alternate work arrangements. Uh, I mean, it, it is, if if I stick to my gun saying that this is an analytical position, that it's very much a creative position as well. Uh, this is a, a kind of role that can be adapted to a number of alternate working arrangements, not necessarily nine to five in the office. So we are right now still very much in completely distributed uh, workplace mode at the PSC and specifically in the enterprise architecture practice. And I, I'm not seeing any particular requirement to, to go back to more traditional working regimen for an enterprise architecture group. But again, this is very specific to organizations, how ways of working, preferences from upper management as well. I'm just saying that in our case, we've been quite adaptable to this, this new strange world of remote uh, workplace, uh, and we see it working for us as well. Allows you to also maybe uh, compete for resources outside the NCR as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, here's another question for you. Can you speak a bit more about what your business operations governance body does and how do they fit in your intake process? We realized at some point that we were not having regular conversations between IT operations and our business partners. And this was leading, it was amplifying problems in that if ever we wanted to communicate to business partners upcoming changes to the operational activities of the organization, or if we wanted to have a frank and honest discussion about maintenance windows and how, how early they should be communicated to the client, or if we had interest material to share or plans to to develop or you know a, a pilot project members to find that we did not have a common governance committee for this we did not have any large interface between IT operations and the business partners. Uh, so we resurrected a committee that had existed briefly in the wake of an incident I won't get into, but it made national news. Um, anyway, we uh, we had at the time created this semi-permanent committee that brought together the business in IT operation as distinct from IT project management and clients. That, that's something else. We wanted something that focused on operations. Uh, and so we, we resurrected this committee. We found a number of 
people in the business lines that were really interested in IT. And we also asked our IT managers to attend these meetings so that we could deliver updates on the introduction of the new version of Windows. We could provide updates on the introduction of M365. More recently, we are talking about the tools required for the return to the workplace initiative. We're also talking about our upcoming transition from VoIP telephony to soft phones in Teams. Uh, and we are able to use this, this committee, which doesn't me really make any decisions. It's really a committee for exchanges, for discussions, for presentations, for feedback, for gathering people interested in this or that other pilot projects. Uh, we found most of our participants for the pilot project on this soft telephony uh, file through this, uh, through this committee. It's not a committee that necessarily talks one full hour every two weeks. Sometimes you've got five minutes worth of material to, to share and that's it. But other times we present what we think are going to be the operational changes that we'll, uh, we will be focused on over the next few weeks. And we use this opportunity to gather client uh, or, or I should say business partner feedback. It's, it's one of our things we're working on. We're trying to remove the word client and replace it by business partners. A uh, little bit of discipline that we're, we're trying to get into the IT shop. Uh, but so it, it's working well. It's again, it's not a committee that makes decisions. And that's kind of the strength of this, this review group is being able to bring everybody on equal footing and just share views, share plans and share feedback on the IT operations on ongoing in the organization. Question for you, for me, uh, when you're hiring uh, on a scale of uh, one to 10, what, what, uh, what level of uh, soft skills are you looking for? It's actually quite important. I won't, I won't give you a numerical value because that would be part of our, uh, our hiring tool, but uh, in, in interviewing people, one thing we do ask is for people to prepare a presentation beforehand and deliver that presentation during the interview. Uh, then we ask a number of more standard questions, but we do evaluate people's ability to synthesize information, to present it in a coherent fashion to people who may not be as technical as the person delivering it. So this is an integral part of our process. We've been able to, uh, to identify some very strong candidates based on uh, how they were able to communicate technical information uh, as importantly as the content of the presentation. Uh, and later on, we'll also ask participants to reflect on their analytical process and talk to us about how they come to various conclusions. So that's a way of asking people to, to self-reflect and also explain what is at the root of their soft skills in that area. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, I was even part of that process. That was a very interesting process. Uh, That's okay. right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I have one more and more question. Uh, I think you talked about it last year. I mean, you had a slide about it. There's lots of books behind you. We see CDs as well. Uh, what books would you recommend in EA? Uh, um, right now, I'm reading a bunch of books on um, CIO stuff, really books for CIOs. Uh, I'll, I'll try to share a number of these recommendations, but there's a CIO paradox. There's the real business of IT. These are books that are meant for chief information officers. And, and I find that reading these books does offer you a complementary perspective on the work you're doing and that it prepares you for the challenges faced by IT, I, I am IT management, which, by the way, are also your challenges. Uh, so being able, and one of the interesting side effects of reading such books that are about the management of IT is that you, you keep taking notes, you keep saying, what are we doing? How does this material compare to my experience in the trenches and the ability that I've got to be able to directly support my management in achieving these objectives? Uh, spoiler alert, most of these books are are about the interface between business and IT, and specifically being able to provide value and uh, to to the business partners, uh, which explains uh, my, my fixation on using business partners rather than clients as a, a, as a bit of vocabulary. You have to think of IT as equal partners with the business. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> of course, uh, we seems like we've lost uh, the feed from <laughs> from Christian. Um, any, in any case, I'd like to thank Christian very much uh, for his his uh, presentation. It was great. Um, also, just to uh, um, just to mention that the previous presentation uh, by uh, Bruno Wella will be made available, uh, at least the deck materials. Um, and also just like to thank everyone from today who presented today across the three streams uh, and in the earlier plenary sessions. We'll be back tomorrow morning with both plenary sessions and three streams uh, starting around noon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Oh, I, 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 your video and audio cut out, Cassian. Yes, uh, I thought that was a dramatic exit for me, but uh, <laughs> that, that actually was a technical issue on my end. We'll try and uh, add some smoke and, and mirrors. And uh, <laughs> anyways, I just wanted to appreciate uh, very much the presentation. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you next year and let's see how things have been going uh, for for. Uh, things at PSC uh, in the next year. Thank you very much. It's been as fun as always. Excellent. Thanks very much. All right. So due to technical uh, issues with the uh, system, I have to wait. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll click on my leave button deliberately this time. <laughs>